This conference will now be recorded. For those of us who couldn't make it here live tonight, this is the virtual author talk. And we have Jerry Norgren and John Fielder. John Fielder has worked tireless, tirelessly to promote the protection of Colorado's ranches, open space, and wildlands during his 40 year career as a nature photographer and publisher. His photography has influenced people and legislation and has earned him recognition, including the 1993 Sierra Club Ansel Adams Award in 2011, the Aldo Leopold's first achievement award ever given to an individual. And in 2017, Colorado Mountain College presented him an honorary degree in sustainable studies. 52 books have been published depicting his Colorado photography. He lives in Summit County, Colorado. So that's a little about John and about Jerry. Jerry Norgan is a fifth generation Colorado native. Having spent most of her life exploring the mountains and all the wonders they hold, she became fascinated with the nomenclature of the highest peaks and began her journey. As a member of the Denver Fortnightly Club, she has authored numerous papers on various topics, including one that grew into this book. A lover of nature and everything it beholds, she lives on a historic farm in Inglewood, surrounded by dogs, coyotes, and a pair of great horned owls. So if you're just joining us, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself, and if you have questions throughout the presentation, please drop them in the chat box and there will be time at the end for a Q&A. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Jerry. Okay. John, are you going to do the introduction? If you wish. Yeah, your, your, your story of how it came about is a good one. Thank you, uh, Taylor, for having us to Gunnison tonight virtually. Hello to everybody in the Gunnison River Basin and Gunnison and up to Crested Butte. I hope we've got some listeners from Crested Butte, one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I'd rather be skiing the North Face with you instead of virtual or um, spending a couple of nights at the Friends Hut. But <clears throat> snow's not too bad up here in Summit County. I'm talking to you from 10 miles north of Silverthorne, Colorado, in the lower Blue River Valley. So I'm looking out my window right now as I'm talking, looking at the uh, Gore Range, kind of shrouded in clouds. Should get a few inches tonight, and I think I'll be at Copper Mountain in the morning to take advantage of that. I hope you get some snow in Crested Butte, too. So about one year ago, <clears throat> I was doing the same thing, but I was skiing in Aspen on that first weekend in March. And, uh, and then the next weekend, I went up to Steamboat Springs to teach a photo workshop, but COVID had started. So we only had a handful of people and I was in a restaurant Sunday night, March, uh, I think it was like March 13th or 14th. And at seven o'clock, we got the word that Governor Polis had shut down ski season. So other than backcountry skiing, I was wondering what I was going to do resort skiing for the next few months as I was driving home to Summit County from Steamboat that night. And then the next morning, I got an email from Jerry Norgren, who I didn't know previously, telling me that she'd spent the last few years doing historical research on how the 58, which is the number that the Colorado Geological Survey recognizes 14ers, how they got named. And also who, uh, you know, effectively climbed them first and wanted to know from me as a publisher if I thought that would be a good idea for a, you know, for a scholarly book. And I said, yeah, great, nice $15 black and white book. And she said, well, I got historical sketches from the artist of the Hayden survey and the Wheeler survey too. And I said, yep, that'd be a nice decoration. And, uh, and then we kind of left it at that. And then that night I couldn't sleep very well. And I remembered that um, over the last 40 years, I've photographed pretty much every square inch of Colorado's 66 million acres, including pretty much every lake, every drainage in the Elk Mountains, the Marinville Snowmass Wilderness, the Fossil Ridge Wilderness to the east of you all, pretty much everywhere. 
and that I probably had, even though I had never set out for any project to photograph all the 14ers, I probably had most of them reflecting in those alpine lakes that I've been to over the years. So I called Jerry back and said, well, let me uh, think about this because maybe we should do a fielder style coffee table book instead. And then over the next couple of weeks, I went through 20,000 plus original four by five inch transparencies, which was the way that I photographed before digital with the large format camera for 25 years, hauling all that gear up and down mountains to, to get those sunrise photographs of mountain reflections. And, and I came up with um, 37, 38 of the 58 14ers just kind of sitting there in my photos smiling at me. And then um, I thought about a man named Bob Robert Wogren who had contacted me in the 90s. And Bob was an architectural painter before the days of computers. He, you know, when a, an architect wanted a rendering of a, of a building, they would uh, hire a painter like Bob to do a, a painting of the rendering. And, but Bob got tired of that and he took on a project in the 80s and the 90s to photograph and then sketch and then at home do oil paintings of all 58 14ers. And he had asked me if I would like to publish a calendar back in the 90s of those. And I declined, but I remembered him. And sure enough, found out that he was still kicking at age 93 in Lakewood, Colorado. And yes, he would be interested in contributing um, photographs that he had made of all those paintings before they got shipped away to people's walls. And he came up with a bunch, and uh, plus his his sketches that he did prior to doing the paintings. And between uh, my photos and and that artwork and the Hayden survey sketches, I had 56 of the 58 rounded up. The only uh, two that I was missing were Cameron and Culebra. And uh, in fact, I just got a text message for, from John Kiedrowski, the mountain climber from Vail, inviting me to ski up this weekend to the uh, Taggart and Green Wilson huts from the Aspen side, which are on the other side of Pearl Pass from Friends Hut. And I had to decline because my one of my daughters, both my daughters actually are pregnant. One's in Nashville and she's coming out this weekend and we're going to do a family thing this weekend, so I can't do the hut. But uh, John had, yes, Culebra and Cameron from his project Sleeping on the Summits, a book he did about actually sleeping on top of all 50 um, four fourteeners, and um, and then taking photos. So he gave me really good photos of those last two. So we had a, a coffee table book. So Jerry and I um, <clears throat> decided to do this, this book with visuals and with her 70,000 words of historical text. And that pretty much took care of any skiing for the rest of the year because from the end of March until June 15th, we did this conveyor belt of her finishing the writing, me sending it to the editor, sending it back to me, me double checking the text, sending it to the designer, Rebecca, to do the graphic design, then to the proofreader. And we did uh, one, one of eight chapters at a time, but it was all overlapped. If we were gonna get this, off to the printer in Asia by June 15th, so the book could be in stores by September 15th, we had to do a conveyor belt overlapping process. So by June 15th, we had put together a book faster than any book I've ever done, and I've done a lot of books. And um, and sure enough, the book hit the stores in September. First printing sold out uh, in February, just as the second printing came in. So we're back in business. That's the cover of the book. Um, you can get it now online from Amazon. If you can't get it at uh, Bookworm, I just talked to Kristen today at Bookworm and Gunnison, and we just shipped her 12 copies today. They'll be in the store probably Friday if you'd like to go get copies from her, and she can always get more if she runs out. But if you can't get to Gunnison or you don't live in the valley, um, just go to Amazon. They're restocked right now, and you can get the book for $45 from um, Amazon, and if you're a Prime member, free shipping. So that's the, as they say in geology, the orogeny of the book. And I'm going to hand it over to Jerry. We're going to do three PowerPoints of photos and sketches and 
artwork with music behind when we're just going to be quiet might you enjoy the visuals and before each one of those jerry's going to tell some of these amazing stories of the history of the naming of the peak so i'll hand it back over to jerry norgren jerry you're muted thanks john or i can't hear you so i'm going to talk about the three range can you hear me now Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't muted. It's okay. Anyway, I'm going to talk about the three um, mountain ranges that surround Gunnison, the Sawatch Range, the Elk Mountains, and the San Juan Mountains. And I'll start off with um, a couple of stories from peaks in the Sawatch Range. Located in the central part of the state, the Sawatch Range extends for 100 miles from the Eagle River on the north to the town of Sawatch on the south. This range boasts 15 14ers, the most in any range in the state, as well as claiming the three highest, Mount Elbert, Mount Massive, and Mount Harvard. Four of the names in this range offer a reminder of the area, area's Native American history, and five represent institutions of higher learning located in what is called the Collegiate Peaks. Although located in the Sawatch Range proper, the five summits known as the Collegiate Peaks acquired the name for a clear reason. The naming began in 1869 when Professor Josiah D. Whitney and Professor William H. Brewer led students on an expedition into the Colorado Rocky Mountains. These students were soon to graduate from the Hooper School of Mining and Practical Geology at Harvard, and what better way to gain practical experience than in the mountains of Colorado, where there was rumored to be 18,000 foot peaks. They arrived in South Park in August in the summer of 1869, and after sighting a group of, group of peaks to the southwest of Granite with no names that they knew of, they resolved to summit them and call one Yale after the university from which both Brewer and Whitney graduated and another Harvard in honor of the student's university. Thus, the tradition of naming peaks after universities had begun and it would only be a matter of time before three more followed suit. And then the story of Mount Massive. The story of this peak's name is one of my favorites because of the fortitude and resolve the citizens of Leadville and Lake County showed when it came to protecting this peak's name. Lying just a few miles to the west of Leadville in the Sawatch Range, the peak was given its name in 1873 by Henry Gannett, topographer with the Hayden Survey. He stated that the mountain named itself, its broad heavy outline suggesting the name at once. Earlier locals and miners had simply called it Massive Mountain. As Leadville grew from its humble beginning as a mining camp, the town and its citizens played an important and unusual role that they, would never, that they never would have expected, that of protecting the name of their beloved mountain. It all began in 1901 when the first of three name change attempts was launched. That year following the assassination of President William McKinley, the editors of the Denver Post took it upon themselves to recognize and commemorate the life of the 25th president by changing the name of Mount Massive to that of Mount McKinley. The editors ran a succession of articles with one particular headline, headline accompanied by a large photo of Mount Massive declaring that Mount Massive seen from a distance is to be renamed Mount McKinley. With Mount Massive residing only a few miles from Leadville and an important geographic icon for the town, it is not surprising that the citizens of the town and surrounding Lake County have strong opinions otherwise. Letters were written, newspaper articles published, and petitions signed, all in opposition of robbing the mountain of its name. The collective voice of the people was heard and the Denver Post dropped its name change campaign. And the citizens were at peace knowing that they had, had helped their beloved mountain retain its name. That is until 1915 when a Leadville miner suggested renaming the peak in honor of Henry Gannett, who had recently passed away. Again, much opposition with passionate letters written, articles in the papers, and even a poignant poem written by the editor of Leadville's newspaper, The Herald Democrat. After much back and forth between the Colorado and U.S. geographic boards, it seemed as if the matter was put to rest and the name of Mount Massive would remain. However, in 1922, the new USGS maps came out, and on the Leadville quad was the name of Gannett Peak. Whether in place of Mount Massive's name or on one of Mount Massive's highest summits, remains uncertain because all of the maps were swiftly destroyed due to the uproar it had caused. After what was considerable opposition, the USGS reconsidered and removed Gannett's name from Mount Massive and instead gave it to the highest peak in Wyoming in the Wind River Range. 
Everyone was happy in knowing they had thwarted name change attempt number two. However, in 1965, a young state senator from Denver launched a third proposal to rename the peak Mount Sir Winston Churchill following the prime minister's death. Considering Churchill had no ties whatsoever to Colorado and its mountains, this fight to reject the proposal was short-lived and swift. Mount Massive withstood three name change attempts and it reigned victorious each time thanks to the dogged determination and loyalty of the citizens of Leadville, Lake County, and the state of Colorado. After 147 years, it appears that that name is here to stay. And another fun story is that of Mount Chopinot. 14 miles northwest of the town of Jerry, are you still there? We seem to have lost you. Hey, Taylor, did she, I couldn't hear anything for that last piece. Was she heard by others? I wasn't hearing anything on my end. It's it's like she froze. Um, yeah, she froze here. So let me uh, take it away and hopefully she comes back. Um, Taylor, would you advance one slide, please? Sure. And uh, before uh, we advance the next slide, I just want to double check, Taylor, do you have your uh, share computer audio setting on? Yes. That'll let the music uh, be heard. So, like I said before, most uh, my 14er photography was done in the 80s and the 90s and the first decade of uh, this century with the large format German Lindhoff 4x5 view camera <clears throat> before the days of digital um, or when it got good at least. Um, that was the camera of choice for most um, serious landscape photographers was 4x5 inch color transparency film in the big view camera with the bellows and between the tripod and the camera and 500 sheets of film and 30 sheet film holders, the whole thing weighed about 65 pounds and it all went into a um, low Alpine, uh, low pro actually, uh, super tracker pack, which Greg Lowe invented for his cinema photography equipment and I adapted to my large format camera equipment. And okay, just like Nick, this view, are you what? back, Jerry? Yeah, can you hear me? Well, we lost you at the end of the uh, third story and we can't see you. And is she still breaking up on your end, Taylor? She seems to be coming through okay. Can you hear us, Jerry? Did you hear her, Taylor? I heard her, but now nothing. Okay, I'm gonna continue. So anyway, the the way that I would uh, explore and photograph Colorado mountains would basically be to uh, hike up. Now, can you hear me? Into one drainage, like like 
that's the Chicago Lakes that uh, Bob Wilgren painted. Um, that it's in, uh, today's. Connection Jerry? just cutting in and out. Yeah, we're gonna. Hey, Jerry, um, we're finished with those three presentations, so I'm gonna uh, finish up my introduction to the um, uh, Swatch Range and the Front Range, and then you can just start over again when we do um, the Elk Mountains. Is that okay? Yeah, we're losing you almost completely. So anyway, I would uh, hike up the drainage like this one, set up the tent um, at least 200 feet from any lake and then be ready at sunrise and sunset to photograph orange light on the peaks reflecting in the lakes. And like I said, even though I never set out to photograph all the 14ers, there's usually cirques and alpine lakes below each of those. So 37, 38 of those ended up being in the background of these photos that I um, discovered. So that's um, that's the modus operandi today since 2010. It's been mostly digital photography for me today. I use the Canon 5D SR, which is a 50 megapixel SLR. And uh, with that technology, you know, the detail and the quality of the photos now with digital is about what it was with the old uh, 4x5 cameras. So I'm in heaven now. I've got 40 pounds less to carry on my back. The 4x5 is the reason why I've got two titanium chromium cobalt knees and one titanium cobalt hip. And those joints actually work well. I do pretty much everything I used to do, um, but um, I don't have to take Advil anymore. So uh, Taylor, if you want to advance, what we're going to do next is just watch a lot of photos from the front range and the so watch range and the 10 mile ranges, and then we'll see if we can get get uh, Jerry back on board. So click the next slide and everybody enjoy the, the beautiful music. I think we've got Johannes Brahms to start. I'm back, I'm back though. though. <laughs> All right, it looks like you called in, Jerry. So maybe if you want to mute your computer and we'll hear you from the phone. Okay. And I'm going to proceed with.
So uh, those last two photos, uh, you saw the Jackson photo and then my repeat photo, that was from that project that I did in 1998 for the book Colorado 1870 to 2000. And um, you'll see a, a few more of those repeat photos where uh, 14ers um, were involved. So uh, Jerry, are you, you're online now via phone. Do you want to talk about uh, the next mountain ranges? Yep, sorry about that. It kept saying I was losing the connection. So I'm going to talk about the Elk Mountains now and have a couple stories um, for that range. Named for the large herds of elk that still roam the area, the name Elk Mountains was not the first choice. While the Hayden Survey was working in this range during the summer of 1873, their original plan was to call this mountain range the National Mountains and name peaks after government departments. The name of Capitol Peak was consistent with this government department theme, as was Treasury Mountain and White House Peak, which was the original name for Snowmass Mountain. Ultimately, however, the long history of local pioneers calling them the Elk Mountains took precedence. As the geologist Ferdinand Hayden was fascinated with the, with the structure of the Elk Range, describing it as a region in which the rocks had been thrown into a greater state of chaos than we had observed anywhere in the West. Little, very little was known about this range and its mountain, mountains until the Hayden surveys of 1873 and 1874 and the Wheeler survey of 1874. And up until then, there was no map representing even the most general features. Hayden's men named the seven 14ers in this range and were the first to summit two of them. And the first one I'll talk about is Maroon Peak and North Maroon Peak. These two peaks are Colorado's most photographed and easily recognized mountain couple. They resemble two bells caught in the act of ringing and are fondly referred to as the Maroon Bells. While in the Elk Mountains during the summers of 1873 and 74, no one from either the Hayden or Wheeler surveys ascended these two peaks, although topographer Henry Gannett and photographer William Henry Jackson did explore much of the area surrounding them. Gannett describes his reasons for the name and for not attempting an ascent. This peak is so named for its peculiar color, that of the sandstones of which it is composed. It is one of the highest peaks in the system and its summit is nearly, if not quite, inaccessible. The summits were considered by the men to be one and they named it Maroon Mountain. In Wheeler's report, assistant geologist John J. Stevenson eloquently describes the peaks and offers a different name. The crest of this exceedingly narrow ridge resembles a line of ancient castles. Indeed, standing in any of the enormous cavities under this ridge from which issue the many streams which form the Roaring Fork, one needs little power of imagination to convince oneself with, to conceive himself within the ruins of some majestic cathedral. He then goes on to proclaim, it, to proclaim that it is probably the weirdest object in this portion of the chain. He dedicates one of the peaks with consent of his associates to Mr. R.P. Whitfield, the distinguished paleontologist of Albany, New York. However, since Hayden's survey reports were widely considered more thorough than Wheeler's, it stands to reason that Stevenson's name of Whitfield for the peak did not endure, and along the way, Maroon Mountain was changed to Maroon Peak, and the peak to the north, which was once, once considered only a prominent shoulder, was recognized as North Maroon Peak. The first ascent, ascent of Maroon Peak may have been in the 1890s by a young man from Crested Butte, although the evidence is only in the form of a letter written some years later. In it, he states, having spent most of the earlier years of my life at Crested Butte, such names as Maroon, Snowmass, and Castle are entirely familiar, and I have been to the top of them all. Ascents which were apparently simple and easy 30 years ago to a boy of 18 would, I am afraid, present an entirely different problem now. Wilson's story notwithstanding, the first recorded summit of North Maroon Peak occurred on August 5, 1908 by Percy Hagerman and Harold Clark via the North Face, a route still considered dangerous and demanding. Three days later, Hagerman summited Maroon Peak alone up the Southwest Face, making the first official ascent of that mountain. By the end of August, Hagerman and Clark, between them, had recorded a total of four first ascents in the Elk Mountains, Maroon Peak, North Maroon Peak, Capitol Peak, and Pyramid Peak. Hagerman was an active member of the Colorado Mountain Club from its beginnings in 1912 and wrote a detailed account of his many climbs in the Elk Mountains. 
the resulting notes on mountaineering in the Elk Mountains of Colorado, 1908 to 1910, as well as Hayden's 1877 Geological and Geographical Atlas of Colorado, were for many years the only guides available to those wishing to climb in the Elk Mountains. In their summers of mountaineering discoveries in the Elks, both Hagerman and Clark became the unrivaled authorities on the majority of the peaks. Not only did they claim first ascents on 414ers and numerous non-14ers, they also pioneered many of the climbing routes still in use today. There are two peaks in the Elks which memorialize the two climbers. A graceful 13,841 foot peak, an extremely sharp ridge of a summit southeast of Snowmass Mountain was named for Hagerman. Clark is remembered by a lofty 13,560 foot summit east of Capitol Peak. Given that this climbing duo summited all the major peaks in the Elk Mountains, it is fitting that their names remain as a, rem as a reminder of their many accomplishments. And now Snowmass Mountain. Located between Capitol Peak and the Maroon Bells, this peak was given several names before one was actually decided upon. In, a, in an 1873 article for the American Journal of Science and Arts, Ferdinand Hayden explains one of these names. Three miles further south of Capitol Peak is another great peak, only about 50 feet lower, which we call the White House, from the conspicuous snowfield about a mile in horizontal breadth and having a slope of half a mile, which covers its eastern face. This snow mass is by far the largest we have found in the mountains of Colorado and distinctly marks and characterizes the peak, even as seen from the front range 80 miles away. The name was in keeping with the original idea to christen the Elk Mountains the National Mountains. The survey's topographer, Henry Gannett, refers to the peak by a different name in the 1874 survey report. Two and three-tenths miles farther south of Capitol Peak on the main ridge is a summit which has been named Snowmass Mount. This also is one of the highest summits in the system, being slightly inferior to Capitol Mountain in elevation. It has received its name from the immense field of snow on its eastern face. The snow field in August, which is the month when there is the least amount of snow in the mountains, has an area of fully five square miles. Probably this is the nearest approach to a glacier in the Rocky Mountains. William Newton Byers, editor of the Rocky Mountain News, often accompanied the Hayden Expedition in Colorado and wrote in the newspaper about his adventures. His, 18, his August 17, 1873 article suggests yet another name for the mountain. We broke camp this morning and started for the great central peak of the range, the extreme western object of our present ambition. Later it was given the name White Bison, and later still White House. What will be the final decision is now uncertain, but we incline to, this, to the name first proposed, Snowmass, because it is the only mountain we have that is uniformly white all the year upon one face. Byers continues to ruminate on the name of the peak and the range in his article a few days later when he says, the name White House has been settled upon in honor of the home of the president. Another lofty peak nearby is to be called Capitol. Some of its silver ribbed neighbors will doubtless be named Treasury and then will follow cabinet, post office, etc. In fact, before we left the Sawatch Range, a proposition to call this wonderful group of cloud piercing peaks the National Mountains was seriously entertained and discussed. Had that been the plan, had that been done, the plan would have been to represent each department in the national government by a like name to as many of the loftiest peaks. Hayden, prior to considering that the Elk Mountains be named the National Mountains, had indeed entertained the idea of calling the Sawatch Range the National Range. Neither suggestion stuck due to the fact that the local people already had established names for these ranges. On August 7th, the fires accompanied the survey men on the first official ascent of Snowmass and it was also the first recorded ascent of any 14er in the Elk Mountains. Byers entertains his readers with some of the details of the climb. The climb was made in from two to three hours by different members of the party. On the summit, we found the scientific men who had been four and a half hours making this ascent. They had unwisely started up from the west and led it to a vast amphitheater filled with broken and loose sliding rocks, the surface partially covered with snow and ice, and rimmed above and at its sides by vertical cliffs. Mr. Gardner, the geographer of this survey, had pronounced it the most difficult and dangerous climb he had ever made. Several times he considered his life in great jeopardy. Three times his attendant saved him from falling backward by planting his tripod against his back. On one of the large snowbanks was a grizzly bear and he stayed during the day. Sometimes he was leisurely sauntering about then rolling over in the snow 
Next, he would take a lunch of grasshoppers and then sit upon his haunches and watch the party. Meyer summed up by saying that he considered the view from the top well worth the climb. And we have some more beautiful <clears throat> photos to show you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, how many of us have uh, stood on top of Buckskin Pass above Maroon Lake and looked um, west towards that massive snow mass on snow mass, one of the great views in the state. So the first sequence of photos and art and music that was actually Front Range, Mosquito Range, and the 10 mile ranges, and now you're going to see your Sawatch Range to the west, which includes not too far away from you in Gunnison, the Fossil Ridge Wilderness, and uh, the Collegiate Peaks, which of course are part of the Sawatch Range, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains to uh, all of our south, and then finally the the Elk Mountains um, and the great Marinville Snowmass Wilderness, which in uh, the summer of 1991, uh, my friend and, and writer Tom Barron uh, and I and his friend Pete and three llamas, we pretty much covered uh, the entire Marinville Snowmass Wilderness in in 30 days, July of 1991, me photographing and Tom writing. And where the llamas couldn't go, which are a lot of places, we would then scramble up into the basins and I would make my reflection photos like Pierre Lake's basin. You know, there's not really a trail up there. So the llamas had to be left down on Snowmass Creek and then we scrambled up there. But in that project in 30 days, we we uh, got to see pretty much every single peak from every angle, and I got to photograph almost every lake um, in the Maroon Bells. And that's that was just one of many times that I've, you know, done multi-day trips in that remarkable um, place. I'm glad to see permitting um, finally being installed in the Maroon Bell Snowmass Wilderness. You know, it's been way too busy for way too many years, especially with the Four Loop Pass and you know, even California back in the 70s had permit systems to limit the number of people in any drainage so to not have damage to the ecological values of those places in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And uh, we really need to do more of that in Colorado as more and more people get out on the trails. On the other hand, there's no substitute for people being outdoors in wild places, not only seeing it, but smelling it, tasting it, touching the lichen on the rocks, hearing the uh, the sound of the wind and the aspen trees as they as they rustle, um, without people really in, enjoying the sensuousness of nature, we will not have true advocates. So it's you know one thing to look at a picture in a book like this one; it's entirely another to be out there. But at the same time, we got to give our public land managers the money, the resources, and our volunteers get more of those folks on the trail to manage people and help them understand the etiquette of how you act and how you don't act when you're in wild places. So, um, Taylor, one more click, and now you're going to hear my second favorite composer, Felix Mendelssohn, and you're going to see um, Sawatch, Collegiate, Elk, and uh, Sangre de Cristos. Enjoy.
And our uh, last geographical territory will be, will be the great San Juan Mountains, which uh, as I delineated in my 2002 book, uh, Mountain Ranges of Colorado, in which I depicted some of these images, but a lot more too, of all 28 Colorado mountain ranges, that the San Juan Mountains are actually the accumulation of six different mountain ranges. So you're gonna see uh, a few of those, especially the ones that have the 14ers in them. So I think Jerry's got some couple of pretty cool stories about the San Juan explorations. Thanks, John. The San Juan Mountains. Although the Hayden survey had briefly been in the San Juan Mountains in the summer of 1873, the real work was accomplished in 1874. Included in the Hayden report for that year was a section written by Franklin Rhoda, assistant topographer with the survey. This documentation of the summer of 1874 entitled Report on the Topography of the San Juan Country seems like the precursor to the ubiquitous elementary school exercise, what I did on my summer vacation. It is masterfully and beautifully written, capturing readers so thoroughly that one could imagine they were there, as well as illustrating how dedicated these men were to their jobs. This report was also a major contributor to the beginnings of mountaineering in Colorado. And the, this story of Sunshine Peak is, is a great one. The tale of the first official ascent of Sunshine Peak is made all the more interesting due to the above mentioned writing of Franklin Rhoda. Situated in the southern San Juan Mountains, this peak qualifies for the Colorado Geological Survey's list of 14ers by a mere foot, as it in jeopardy of losing its status when new advanced measurements will be released in 2022. The first official ascent was made in 1874 by two members of the Hayden Survey, Franklin Rhoda and A.D. Wilson after whom Mount Wilson and Wilson Peak are named. As topographers with the survey, they use Sunshine Peak as they did many other high peaks as a triangulation station for getting measurements of the surrounding mountains. These peaks were often referred to as stations and assigned only a number with no name. Sunshine Peak was merely station 12 on their maps and didn't receive its name until 1906 and was given the name by the US Geological Survey with no explanation. Prior to the surveys of 1873 and 74, the peak had the previous names of Niagara Peak and Sherman Mountain, but neither were acknowledged by either the Hayden nor the Wheeler surveys. Once on the summit of Sunshine Peak, Rhoda and Wilson had barely started their work when they began to feel a tickling sensation in their hair. And as Rhoda tells it, at first this sensation was only perceptible and not at all troublesome. Still, its strength surprised us since the cloud causing it was several miles distant to the southwest of us. By holding up our hands above our heads, a tickling sound was produced, which was still louder if we held a hammer or other instrument in our hand. The tickling sensation above mentioned increased quite regularly at first, and presently was accompanied by a peculiar, peculiar sound, almost like that produced by the frying of bacon. We felt that we could not stop though. The frying of our hair became louder and more disagreeable for certain parts of the drainage of the region could not be seen from any other peak and we did not want to make this ascent a second time. They continued working until the lightning strokes were coming quicker and quicker and according to Rhoda, only separated by two to three minutes of time and we knew our peak would soon be struck. The instruments were producing a terrible humming which with the noises emitted by the thousands of angular blocks of stone and the sounds produced by their hair made such a din they could scarcely think. The duo made a mad dash for it and headed down as quickly as possible and finally reached their camp late at night, thoroughly drenched, tired, and hungry. Rhoda humorously shares his thoughts regarding the ending of their harrowing day. If I could end the history of the adventures of this remarkable day by describing how we were pleasantly housed in dry, comfortable quarters and how we contentedly wrapped the drapery of our couch above us and laid a pleasant dreams, I would, but alas, how the romance would be taken out of the story if I should tell you how we crawled into our low, short, and narrow little tents with the water running down the edges and leaking through at the top, and how we had to lie as still as possible lest we might disturb the pools of water, gradually collecting on our blankets and precipitate them into the lower recesses of our bedclothes. All this and more shall I leave untold. And another peak with a great story is El Dante. Located in the sub-range of the San Juan Mountains, known as the San Miguel Mountains, 
El Dayente was not attempted by the men of the Hayden Survey in the summer of 1874. They did, however, climb neighboring Mount Wilson and only gave a mere mention to El Dayente in their report, which said, to the west and quite near was a pretty high peak. It wouldn't be until July 4, 1930, that the mountain was first descended and named by Dwight Lavender and two other men, or so it was thought. Lavender called it El Dayente, which in Spanish means the tooth, because the peak's ragged outline resembled many teeth. A few months after his climb, Lavender came across an article in an 1891 issue of an Alpine journal written by Percy Thomas, where he talks about his climb up Mount Wilson in 1890. As Lavender delved into the details of the article, he began to realize that the peak Thomas claimed to have climbed was not Mount Wilson, but indeed El Dayente. In a 1931 article for the Colorado Mountain Club's Trail and Timberline, Lavender explains in detail how he came up to this conclusion and assigns the first descent to Thomas. At an early age, Dwight Lavender took an enthusiastic interest in mountaineering and exploration, and with two others would form the core of an energetic group known as the San Juan Mountaineers and they would contribute more to the knowledge of mountaineering in the San Juans than any other group. Unfortunately, the mountaineering community would never fully realize all that Lavender was capable of contributing. In 1934, after returning to Stanford University to resume his graduate studies in geology, he died suddenly from polio at the age of 23. Few have contributed more to the sport in such a short time than Dwight Lavender. He is remembered by a peak named in his honor, Lavender Peak, which is located in the La Plata Mountains near Durango. And I think we're gonna finish with some more beautiful photos. Thank you, Jerry. You know, the Sunshine Peak um, story reminds me that uh, nothing ever really changes as with the names of peaks. It's just as polemical today um, for completely different reasons though. Um, as it was back in the 19th century. And with regard to tents, those of you who are backpackers, tents leaked in the 1870s and they still leak today. So please enjoy some more Johannes Brahms and the 14ers and the sub peaks of the San Juan Mountains. Take it away, Taylor.
Well, uh, the timing was a little off at the end there. I didn't mean for the crescendo to be imposed upon by a hard sell, but there it is. $45, 160 pages, Jerry's amazing text, 125 photos and all that great artwork. And uh, it's back in stock at Amazon, but check first with uh, Kristen at Bookworm. She'll have those books in, 12 books on um, Friday, Monday latest. And thank you all very much for coming to the show tonight. And Taylor, um, Jerry and I are happy to answer any questions that uh, the Valet has. Thanks. Yeah, one came in the chat while we were uh, going. It says, what is the history behind the name of Mount Mount Elbert? Mount Elbert, wait, I have to go, it echoes, <laughs> was named after um, a Colorado statesman. Um, I can't remember exactly all the particulars, but um, there was a time when, if you look at the mountain ranges as the um, survey people were going through them, the names were, a lot of the names were very indicative of what was going on in the, in the ter Colorado Territory or the state at the time and in the country at the time. And miners really revered um, politicians. So there were a lot of politician names um, added to peaks during a certain period of time. I hope that helps. Yeah, I might. Great. Anyone else feel free to unmute yourself and, and go for a question. Jerry, I wanted to ask, um, I, I believe I heard recently that Mount Evans might get a name change. If that's true, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, that's true. Um, there has been great um, dispute about Governor Evans. I don't know how, if all of you are familiar with his involvement and subsequent resignation as territorial governor because of his involvement in the Sand Creek Massacre in 1870, 1863. And um, where I think it was 200 Cheyenne Arapaho Innis elders and children were killed. And um, so that is the reason to have his name removed from the peak. And several um, names have been proposed, one of them being Mount Blue Sky, but it's it's getting pretty tricky because not all, not all of the um, Arapaho Cheyenne people agree on that name. And so it's gonna be, it's gonna be a long drawn out process. Okay. I'm just going to mention I just moved here from Anthem Ranch in Broomfield, Colorado. I'm still getting settled. I just moved on Friday. But oh, wow. all, all of our streets are named after the peaks, after the 14ers and, oh, and wow. some other peaks. And oh my gosh, it was, I mean, I knew that. I know where some of these peaks are because I'm from Colorado. But it was just so much fun to see them, you know, because I probably know 200 people there. I've lived there 14 years, 13 years. And so I know people on every one of those streets named after these mountains. So oh, it was really, that's, really, that's interesting. really, really fun. Yeah, it's a great, it's a 55 plus community. And I enjoyed my time there, but I have grandchildren here. So I decided I time to move back and help take care of them. So I hope to see some of you at some point. All right. Thanks for sharing that story. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, does John Fielder live here? Do you live in Crested Butte? <clears throat> no, I'm not actually from here. Oh. From Earth. I'm from elsewhere. Okay. Not from CB. Okay. Well, I no, admire... I was just making a joke. I... No, I live, uh, I raised my family in Greenwood Village in 2006. I moved to Summit County. If you know Silverthorne, after you come down out of the tunnel, um, you yeah. make a right-hand turn like you're going to Steamboat on Highway 9, and that's yeah. the Lower Blue River Valley. And right. I found a really cool piece of property 
up in the Williams Fork Mountains, which is the mountain range on the right. The Gore Range is on the left at about 9,400 feet. So like I said, I'm looking out at the Gore Range or Gore Range is in the clouds right now. Um, oh. But, you know, Crest, I teach a, uh, up until this year with COVID, I teach a photography workshop in Crested Butte every July or a couple of them. And uh, I first got to Crested Butte in the summer of 19... 69 when I was working for Colorado Fuel and Iron CFNI Steel Corporation based in Pueblo and I was a junior geologist for two summers in college prospecting for non-ferrous metals so believe it or not I was in Crested Butte 1969 and been coming back every year since. Uh, I moved here in 81 and I came with the AMAX Corporation speaking of ferrous metals we were trying to you know, mine Mount Emmons and High Country Citizens Alliance said, uh-uh. So we didn't last yep. very long, but it's good to be back. That's been, uh, been one of Crested Butte's uh, greatest accomplishments is ultimately, and we're getting pretty close, I know High Country Citizens Alliance, to shutting that down forever. So congratulations, Crested Butte. Yeah, I'm I'm happy too that they didn't ruin this valley, this upper valley. So our next question comes to us uh, from Alan. He asks, Jerry, are you related to Carl A. Norgren? He met him in 1964. Yes, that was my grandfather. Where did oh. you meet him? Oh, was that just a written question, Taylor? Oh yeah, it was a written question. He said he can't unmute his mic. Oh, okay. Yes, my grandfather. Cool. All right, nice. Thank you very much. Jerry, can I ask you what inspired you to tell these stories? Um, it was, I never set out to do this. I'm a member of a women's literary organization called the Denver Fortnightly Club that was established in 1881. And about four years ago, in one of our meetings, the then president was reading um, old articles and old things out of the um, from the minutes and stuff. And she read an article from 1975 out of the Denver Post that said the Denver Fortnightly Club was instrumental in having the name of Mount Rosalie changed to Mount Evans. And I had never heard that before. And I'm a fifth generation native, and that that's what started the whole thing. And came home and Googled it and, you know, got the, got the simple story. And then I just started researching like crazy. And then I thought, I'm just, I want to research all the names. And then I realized it had never been done. And oh. I just started getting, you know, just gathering all the information. And what I did was is I have 12 two inch binders and in each binder is a range. And in each range is all of the, all of the 14ers. And anything I would find, I would put into that section. And, um, you know, when I would check the notebook periodically and when there was a section that didn't have much, I'd go start ferreting out that, you know, the stories on that. And I was at the Western History section of the Denver Public Library, the National Archives, up the new location up north, the USGS Library in Lakewood, the Alpine Library in Golden, um, History Colorado just gathering all sorts of information. And then at some point I realized it should be a book because it hadn't been done. <laughs> so that's how it started. It was a complete accident. Yeah, thank you. I just, one quick follow-up question. Do you have a favorite story from all of your research? Uh, Mount Massive is one of my favorites and it's um, it goes on into even greater detail in the book. Um, just because of the determination of the town of Leadville, especially to protect that name of that mountain. I mean, it's their mountain, and um, that, that is one of my favorites. And Mount Evans is, too, of how the name of Mount Rosalie came to be. That's another one of my favorites. It's a, it's a story of romance. <laughs> and those are probably just my, my two favorites. Thank you.
All right, any last questions for Jerry or John? Seeing none, I think that is all for this evening. Thank you so much uh, to both of you uh, for being here to present for us and for everyone for attending. This is a great uh, first virtual program. We're excited to start back up and do more programs as, as your library. Thank you both. Thank you, Taylor, well, for you. having us. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Taylor. Thank you, everybody. Good night.